Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Morecambe. On tonight's panel, James Heapy, an officer in the army before becoming an MP. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan and is now the government's minister for the armed forces. Labour's shadow business secretary, previously shadow minister in several departments under both Jeremy Corbyn and Keir Starmer, Jonathan Reynolds. Alison Phillips, journalist and editor of The Daily Mirror, which led the way in breaking stories of partying at number 10 during the pandemic entrepreneur and founder of her own IT company specialising in healthcare and participant in TV programmes such as Secret Millionaire and The Apprentice You're Fired, Kavita Oberoi, and economist, author, former Moscow correspondent at The Economist and GB News presenter, Liam Halligan. Welcome to my panel. Welcome to the audience here in Morecambe. Very nice to see you and very nice to see you at home, of course, as well. Thank you for joining us and do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. So let's take our first question, which is from Rob Wiley. Hi. Um, with the cost of living crisis, um, should the national insurance rise be postponed? Uh, which will be coming in in April. What's your view, Rob? I think it probably should be. There's a lot of people, especially in areas like this, as having their finances squeezed and they're struggling as it is. We've got energy fuel prices going through the roof, all that sort of thing. Um, you'd be very lucky if you get a wage rise in this area that matches inflation. People, people who work full time, long hours, not just 40 hour weeks, 50 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks, are struggling to make ends meet and it's just I think it, it could do with being held off. Should it be postponed then? Well, Cabinet uh, agreed to do it, and I think it was the right decision to take, given that the point of it is to raise money that is much needed to uh, both address the inequity of social care provision in this country and the uh, waiting lists that have built up uh, during the pandemic that we need to address within the NHS. You've got a um, number of Conservative MPs now saying that it should be delayed, not least the head of the Treasury Select Committee, a former minister. Do you think that well, line true. will hold? Well, look, I mean, I think you know, you'll have noticed that the uh, top of the government is in listening mode at the moment. Uh, and, um, but the Cabinet took the decision. Uh, and I think <laughs> that it's important to, to recognise that actually, as a tax, it will, 40, I think, sort of, 50% of the revenue is raised by the top 14% of taxpayers, and there's 6 million people that pay nothing at all. So, um, you know, it isn't the, uh, the blunt instrument that some people have described it as. But I know, and it's the same for all of us, that prices are rising quickly. There is a challenge uh, to how we make ends meet. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate to have, I think on the panel, jobs that pay pretty well. But there are plenty of people that are on good salaries that are starting to worry about how they're going to make things meet and the government is seeking to address that both through interventions in the energy market and uh, half a billion pounds um, for those who are really struggling to help uh, with their bills and cost of living. But so you certainly it's, um, you know, we're going to need to do a lot I think over the next few years to help people with this. Alison. Um, well I think Rob's hit the nail on the head in that <clears throat> we're looking at a really really tough sort of winter going into spring ahead you know uh, inflation six percent um, and then this and then energy bills I mean that is going to come as a, a horrible shock to people fairly shortly you know ordinary families they're going to be looking at something like 500 pounds extra per year on their energy bills so uh, it's going to be particularly difficult for those that are least well off but it's going to be really tough I think for everybody in this country and, and we're now looking at this the national insurance hike which was decided on back in September when inflation wasn't looking as bad as it is now, which are now looking at 6%. Things have got considerably worse in the interim. And I think what, when, when, I, when I talk to sort of our readers, mirror readers, sort of, um, that what their main concern that can make is it doesn't sort of feel very fair because this also, of course, is, is much harder on younger people. It's much harder on people on, on lower incomes as well. And there are other ways that this money could be raised. Yes, we need to address shortages in the NHS. Yes, we need to sort out finally social care. But this doesn't seem to have been the fairest way to do it. And, and I, I, something has to be looked at. Got right. a few hands up. Yes, the one here. 
Um, yeah, the hike in the national insurance is 1.5 percent. You you say 1.25, yeah. 1.25, which percentage is percentage points actually. Well, which is different from percentage. Yeah, well done. yeah which is small <laughs> when you think about the rise in inflation, and that rise in inflation doesn't take into account the real cost to people on low incomes. <laughs> Because when you actually look at that and the things that they buy, the non-electric guitars and all the stuff that they put in that to get to that figure, they lower price goods in the supermarket, so that inflation is even higher. So in light of that, if they do delay it, 1.25% as opposed to everything else that's going on and the energy bills that are going to be horrendous uh, and people aren't getting rises, the, the pensioners have been you know, done over again with a triple lock. And there are lots of people, like the gentleman says, especially in this area, that are on very low incomes and they're going to really, really suffer. So the 1.25%, yeah, needs looking at. That isn't the whole picture. There's an awful lot more there. OK. Who on here in the grey sweater? So against this backdrop, uh, some years ago, Liz Truss said that public sector workers should take personal responsibility for the money they spend and save. Does the panel think that Liz Truss should take personal responsibility for the private jet she, threw, she flew to Australia at an estimated cost of half a million pounds to the taxpayer? Yeah, do you just very quickly want to deal with that? Because that's been in the news tonight. So this is a flight that, that Liz Truss, to, obviously Foreign Secretary to Australia, it was a, a, pri a, a government Airbus as opposed to your regular, you know, Qantas or British Airways or whatever it might be. And, a, yeah. and, and it is reported to have cost something like half a million. Well, I mean, so I, for money? Well, I read the, the story, and I think what happened is another operator of private aviation has said it would cost half a million. I think if, it, if it's already a jet that's leased by the government, I expect it probably didn't cost that. So how much did it cost? But I, I don't know the operational security concerns that went into her deciding to travel privately, um, but I've, I read the same story. Uh, Do I you approve? It did cost half a million. Well, look, you know, last week I flew to Kiev on a private RAF operated flight because the security and operational situation required me to fly on an RAF private plane to Kiev on the job that I was doing and the people that I was flying with because the stuff we were going to do was sensitive. So, you know, having flown so, on a private plane myself in the last ten days, that's a bit, I, I'm but, quite okay. hypocritical of me to criticise. But she was going to, she was going to Australia. She wasn't going to Kiev, was she? I, mean, I, mean, okay. I don't know what pounds. the security let's, concerns. Are. Let's get back to the subject. The man here in the blue shirt. Thank you. I was um, fortunate enough to be in a school this, this morning, um, uh, and I came across a, a, a lady who I won't say anything but she was employed by the school to do the cleaning at the beginning of covid she was employed to go around cleaning chairs tables doorstops she was in tears today because she was opening up to a colleague that she didn't have enough to make in an ends meet so she's one of those people it's a terrible expression is just about managing and she hasn't got enough food to put on the table as well as the energy as well as the food price increases and the national insurance and she works hard and you think it should be delayed then? The national Absolutely, insurance right? I should. I know we've got a, a, a huge budget. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it should be delayed. And if the government are so desperate for money, why did Rishi Sunak write off the furlough debt as quickly as he did? Okay. Kavita, obviously this national insurance rise affects employees, but also employers. It does affect uh, employers as well. I mean, I definitely um, agree that it should be delayed. Um, you know, especially as the cost of borrowing is lower than expected at the moment. Um, and uh, it affects employers as well, it affects businesses because we're having to pay increased uh, 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 taxes. Um, and businesses have gone through a very tough time over the last couple of years. And again, with the energy rises, I mean, I also run a serviced office business, we've got 20,000 square feet. And it's been absolutely shocking in terms of some of the rises that we've seen just in the last month in terms of our bills. And we can't just go ahead and suddenly start increasing prices. So you're feeling that squeeze all the time. So it impacts everyone. But I absolutely agree that it should be delayed. You're nodding your head there, Jonathan. Oh, I think there's no question it should be delayed. I mean, you've got a situation and people clearly are already aware of it, where every household in the country, and for pensioners as well, are facing a real terms pay cut. You have a situation in energy bills which is close to unprecedented, the average bill heading towards £2,000. The government needs to help people with those factors and at the minute it's actually going to make it worse by putting up the tax in this way. You're right to say it's a, it's a, a rise of one and a quarter percentage points. It's actually a 10% rise 
overall. So it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But I also but if, want to if, say... But without, without that increase, so how is the government going to pay for... NHS backlog for health and social. Well, Where's the money going to come absolutely from? Absolutely. So the point is, first of all, it doesn't go to social care, and I resent the fact it's been presented that way. It's at least three years, probably never, that it will go to social care. So that, <laughs> that is deliberately misleading. So the question I ask is, where, but, but, where, where, yes, where, where should the money absolutely. come from? And if you're going to raise money this way, and I think you should raise money for the NHS, it's got to be a fair way of doing so. It, it should affect all forms of income. People who get income from property, from shares, as well as working people. It's far too narrow. So a rise in income tax, well, is think, that what you're I, suggesting? I think there's a range of options that are available it doesn't it is a range of taxes that would raise that revenue but to do it this way and think people aren't going to realize because it's called national insurance rather than another form of tax it's, it's playing the public for fools and i think they're onto it Charities have already shown in the last quarter that the use of food banks can't cope anymore so does this mean children will go to school hungry man in the gray jacket <clears throat> Where we're talking about people struggling financially, when are we going to see some real investment in towns like Morecambe? Um, the one here with the, with the scarf, yes. Um, you, it needs delaying because um, the, um, the household fund, the 500 million household fund, also runs out on the 31st of March. That came in because of the £20 universal credit was taken away by the government. It's take, take, take. That's another uh, amount of money being taken off of people. I spoke to um, somebody from the uh, Citizens Advice uh, and they've told me that um, the food banks are supposed to be there for emergencies. In Morecambe, every day is an emergency for a lot of families. So you need to sit up and take note. Rob's absolutely right, of course. There is a triple whammy coming in terms of the cost of living. You've got energy bills. The energy price cap is probably going to go up above £2,000. That's for the average household from around 1200 now. An enormous increase. You've got not just the, these NIC rises coming in in April, but also the freezing of the basic rate tax bracket, which means as we have inflation, more people are dragged into that. And the lady here is exactly right. The CPI, Consumer Price Index Inflation Measure, is 5.4%. Real inflation is much higher than that. The old RPI that we used to use is 7.2%. And actual inflation, if a big chunk of what you spend is spent on necessities like food and fuel, is much higher. Now, delaying this rise in NICs, let me tell you, it's absolutely possible and makes a lot of sense. Not my words. The words of Professor Jajit Chadha, who runs the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, the UK's most respected and long-standing economic think tank. He said that on my GB News show this lunchtime. There Which is, is a, a fiscal... marvellous plug for your show, <laughs> yeah, but where's, so where's he suggesting the money comes from? We, 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 we don't get massive state subsidies, so we have to take our chances, Fiona. There is fiscal headroom to do <laughs> what? this. What a cheap shot. There, where's he suggesting not, the money comes it's from, a three and then, and a half billion pound Liam? Liam, where's cheap. he suggesting the money should come from, then? He's saying that if you shelve it, you'll get more growth, because this is a tax on jobs, as a lot of the audience have said. Paul Johnson, who runs the Institute for Fiscal Studies, you'll hear about them when we row over numbers during election campaigns. Massively respected. He says there is the fiscal headroom to do this. The trouble we've got now is that there is far too much tax, I would say, on people's work, on their labour, particularly at the lower end of the income spectrum. There's not nearly enough taxation, I would say. I like lower low taxes in general, but we should be taxing more unearned wealth rather than... The, 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 the people work with their hands, getting up every day with their alarm clocks to go to tough jobs. <laughs> and I've got huge respect for the Mirror and Alison Phillips. She's a fantastic journalist. And maybe it was a slip of the tongue. But I don't think this cost of living rise is going to be really hard for everybody. I don't think there's going to be a real terms pay cut, Jonathan, with due respect again for every household in the country. A lot of the laptop classes have done really well during lockdown. They're not paying money on trains. It's been cheaper for them. They spent a lot more time working at home because they don't have, they don't work in factories. They don't have customer-facing jobs. So I do think there's a case, and I say this, you know, with some reservation. But we are now in a situation where I wouldn't be taxing people at the lower end of the income spectrum, basic rate taxpayers okay. raising their national insurance contributions. If we do need more money, I'd get it from growth and also more tax on unearned income. All here in the band, Hi. Um, I earn just above the, the northwest average wage. I'm a single female with no dependents, but all I ever hear is 
this will affect families and we will look at a package that will help families and the low paid and I feel like it's you stand in the corner with your purse open and we'll all dib in and you can have what's left. When is something going to be done for forgotten minorities to include us? We are part of the electorate. We pay our taxes. Well, no, no. In the pink and purple top there, yes. Um, I'd just like to point out that this very building that we're in, up until last summer, was the food bank. This hall, you can see how big it is, was stuffed with food. And that was in July. Um, it then moved out to another building somewhere else. But the point is, the need has gone up. So can you imagine this place was filled with food for the food families um, of Morecambe? This is what they needed. And that was before this major crisis hit. It has got significantly worse. And we're not talking about people who are sitting there with their hands out waiting for free food. They are people who aren't generally working. The majority of our clients in those days were working. How can we even be talking about raising national insurance when the figures, the percentages are banded around left, right and centre and as you were speaking about, we're, we're talking about this huge raise in inflation and 5.4% I think you mentioned, but the lived experience of people exactly. here doesn't yeah. sound anything like that number. If we're going to start asking the public to pay more, shouldn't all the figures that we use be accurately assessed and credible? Right. Because people will do things and support things if they know they're based on a true assessment of the facts, and that inflationary figure <coughs> does not represent what people here are feeling. So James, you're not getting a lot of support in the room for the national insurance. Uh, rise. I think it's a fair summation uh, of, of what I'm hearing. You said the government's in listening mode, which I think is you softening us up for saying it may well in fact get delayed after all. If you're a betting man, would you say it's going to get delayed? I, I, look, I, I'm not going to, to go there because it's not for me to say and I'm not privy to the conversations. Um, but, I mean, it wasn't, I, don't think, I don't think there's a majority. I think it is absolute. Everybody in the room is, is against it. Everybody in the room is, is that feeling fair? the squeak. Are you all against it? Yeah. Um, everybody at home is, is feeling the squeeze. I mean, what I hear here in Lancashire, I hear in Somerset too. Um, I think so why go through well, well, I think government is looking at what other interventions it can make. I think that the, the tone of what we've been hearing so far is that whereas Labour have, say, cut VAT on fuel, which actually is a value-added tax and therefore people with the biggest heating bills make the biggest saving, Government's been saying, well, let's make a more targeted intervention. Don't accept that. Well, uh, don't accept it, no, then, but, but, that is, that but the tone of what government has been saying if, so far has been around If your energy bill is a massive part of what you spend notes. every week, 5% off your energy bill is a very big deal, James. I, I'm not disputing that, but the point is, is that I think the government has been looking, instead of universal measures, are actually things that target those who are most hard-pressed. Now, debate whether or not that's the right approach, mm. We're sitting up and listening exactly as one of the questioners said that we must. But government has, made, has set out a view about how it wants to deal with this uh, and instead of it being universal measures, which have their merits, gone down a different track. Okay, all the, right, I'm just... Uh, the Labour policy sorry. is to cut VAT on bills so everyone would have some benefit because everyone needs some relief and to inc increase the scope and eligibility for warm homes discounts so the people in the most need would get the okay. most help. The reason the government aren't doing it is it they're trying to save the Prime Minister rather than focus on the things that really matter. That's the bottom line to it. I'm going to move on. Uh, but before I do, I just want to tell you that next week we will be in London and the week after that we'll be in Newport. Things may have quietened down politically next week. Who knows? I doubt it. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say on a whole range of issues. So if you want to be in the audience, London next week, Newport the week after, do go to the Question Time website. You can see the details and apply to be in our audience. We would love to see you. Right, let's take another question now, which is from <coughs> Graham Morby. Is the love affair between Boris Johnson and the British public finally over? Graeme, some of us didn't love him that much to begin with, but um, I acknowledge he was always a difficult opponent. I mean, look, for me, the thing with Boris Johnson is, if he told me it was raining, I would go outside and check. And I think that is the problem with everything that he does. And look, it, 
It shouldn't take a report to find out if the Prime Minister of this country is telling the truth. And I think we know what went on. We, we know that his account and his apology, or, or however you describe it in Parliament, wasn't accurate. And I do think people are seeing that. And I think it's not just about the, the events of whether it was a party or whether he was ambushed by a cake or whatever. It's that we can't trust the Prime Minister of this country to tell us the truth. And people want, going back to the previous question, a real focus on the things that matter, whether that's energy bills and inflation here in the UK or the very worrying situation in Russia and Ukraine. And we can't have that. And we can't have that because the Prime Minister is focused on himself and the Cabinet are either preparing their leadership bids or they're trying to ignore this and rally around him or whatever they're trying to do right now. And we deserve better than that. And I think that is why yeah. people are so, so angry about this. And, and it's true to tell you, tell me that Boris Johnson, his, his, his approval ratings are plummeting. Keir Starmer's are improving, but he's still got negative approval ratings. Is it fair to say the love affair with Keir Starmer hasn't even begun? Look, uh, if you look at the, the result that Labour got in 2019 and you look where we are, Keir Starmer is, a, you know, someone who has repaired so much of the damage. Clearly, there's a long way to go. You can't have a record historical defeat like we had two, two or three years ago and just expect to bounce back. But he's a person of integrity, of ability. He could be the Prime Minister and he could be the Prime Minister for the right reasons. And that is not what we've got at the minute. And that is I want from the, what I want from the leader of the Labour Party. And I think that's what the public want from that too. Liam. Well, clearly, there's righteous anger across the country. Uh, at what seems to have gone on in Downing Street during lockdown when so many of us were making so many sacrifices, uh, and, and rightly so. To what extent the Prime Minister was involved in those parties, instigated those parties, I don't know. I don't think anyone will know for sure until this report comes out. It's a bit like waiting for Godot. You know, it's, it's a tragedy for the Prime Minister personally because he has actually got a pretty good story to tell. We're at 95% immunity in this country. We had Freedom Day in July, in fairness, in, in, uh, to con co contradicting a lot of what the opposition parties were saying. Uh, and we, of course, didn't have lockdown at Christmas that a lot of other politicians and SAGE members were calling for. So the Prime Minister held his nerve there, or at least he had his nerve held for him by some of his backbenchers. And I do think that is to his credit. We are in the UK. It's been really difficult for all of us, more difficult for some than others, as I said earlier. But he does, does deserve some credit for putting us where we are. The thing is, po politicians are imperfect human beings. And some of the best political leaders, people like Winston Churchill, people like Bill Clinton in the States, are often people whose morality doesn't always rub people up the right way. He's now put himself, despite his 80-seat majority, despite his undoubted talent as a communicator, which I think everybody would acknowledge, he's now put himself absolutely at the mercy of the political ebbs and flows and fortune. His, his whole political future is basically in the hands of an unelected civil servant. And there's something a little bit weird about that. There is righteous anger across the country. I'd also say, though, there's also a concern that the media is drip, drip, drip feeding information <laughs> in order to unseat a democratically elected leader, whatever his failings, and they are many. No. Woman in the tartan jacket. Hi. Rory Stewart um, said that, like, Boris is an inveterate liar, or words that effect. And um, uh, many, many people apparently knew, the, those around knew that Boris was um, a liar, um, has been, and it's part of his political toolbox. So why do we as the electorate have to wait wait for his resignation, surely he should be doing this before the Sue Gray outcome. All right. The woman at the back there in grey. Um, how are people meant to trust the government when it's just lies after lies after lies? And it seems to be people in power seem to think that they can get away with whatever. And this has been going on for years and years and years. So do you think he's, he's no, no better, no worse than any other politicians that have come before? Pretty much, yeah. And, and I think this is why you've got a rise of conspiracy theories and fake news and all of this, because people are looking for something to believe in and they can't believe in the government anymore. All right, the woman here, yes. There is no credible alternative, though. When is Labour going to give us a credible alternative to the Conservatives? <laughs> I will come back to you. James. 
Is the love affair between Boris Johnson and the British public finally over? I think it's under a lot of strain. Um, I, look, people are furious, absolutely furious. Are you furious? Yeah. With him? Well, with the whole thing, frankly. Um, I just... <laughs> I, I just... Yeah, I, I, I wish that right up front, it was like, right, this happened, that was that. Um, and then we could have had the apology and moved on, but we didn't. Uh, I listened to what the Prime Minister said at the dispatch box the other week, and I believe him. Uh, which, bit, which bit are you referring to that he said? Well, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to be facetious. Which bit do you, did you believe? Well, I, I believe that... I, I mean, I think that the thing that came out about the ambush with the cake, I, I don't know that that's... Um, that, that that's quite as egregious as everybody says. I mean, I think if he's kind of working and people come into a room with a cake, that's not exactly his fault. Um, but the, 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 the two things that I think have really cut through, three things. Um, the video of the Downing Street staff, he was right to get out and apologise very, very quickly for that because people across the country were furious. Um, the, the events that happened uh, before, on the eve of the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh, people were really angry about that, and he was right to get out and apologise. And then the one that allegedly involved him, the event outside in the, in the garden. I mean, I, I spent some time as his parliamentary private secretary, so his sort of bag carrier, if you like. And, you know, the guy, all prime ministers lead an extraordinary existence. They kind of sit there and people come in, they quickly pre-brief them for what's next, and that meeting happens, and you bounce from issue to issue to issue. And I, on occasion, was that person who came and said, right, prime minister, out in the garden, we've got some people from wherever, you're going to go out, say hello, <coughs> this is what's going to happen. You, there's, it's a sort of from his study to the garden is a 30-second walk. So it makes sense to me that what he said, that as he was going downstairs, he didn't know what he was going to uh, he was sorry that on reflection he didn't shut it down straight away. I heard him say that at the dispatch box, and I accepted that. Lots and lots of people in my constituency and around the country don't want to accept that, and that's why waiting for Sue Gray's report is necessary and important. But just if I may, Jonathan said that the problem is, is this is a big distraction. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, since this story broke, the party gate thing, um, Omicron came... And I was sat in meeting after meeting after meeting over Christmas in which the Prime Minister was laser-like focused on the booster campaign. In the last few weeks, we've seen the biggest build-up of troops on the European continent since 1945. And I can tell you that I've been in meeting after meeting where the Prime Minister was laser-like focused on the threat to our national security that presents. Last night, he came across to the Ministry of Defence and was briefed by the Chief of the Defence Staff about what all this means for us. And he sat there for an hour and a half to two hours. And I can tell you that he was not distracted. He was entirely focused okay. on making the right decisions for our country at a very challenging time. Alison. <laughs> I think that the mirror is what started us on this, on this journey. Yes. The, the, the question is, is the love affair with Boris Johnson and the, between Boris Johnson and the British public finally over? Well, I think it's a really interesting line that about a love affair because it, Boris Johnson is almost like one of those blokes that a friend might go out with and he lies and he lies and he lies to them and he keeps and then he'll come back and say oh, I'm terribly sorry I didn't mean it that time and, and then he does it again and he lies about something else and, and and still he gets forgiven and then at some point you just sort of think but you could do so much better than this and we as a country we're a country where our values are about honesty and about decency and integrity and I, and I, I think the, the lady that said all politicians are the same I'm not sure that's entirely true I mean I've never voted Conservative in my life however when we had a Prime Minister like Theresa May, she may have had faults, but I think she had integrity, I think she had honesty, and I think what we've got with Boris Johnson is, is a very different, very different thing in that... So when, when, the, when we first ran this story back in... Uh, first of December it was, we sort of first had this story about the parties and then another one came out, and I was saying to our <coughs> politics editor and our news editor, I was saying, are you sure about this? Are you absolutely sure? If we've been back, if we checked it, if we checked it? I said, because I cannot believe... A, I cannot believe that, that people would be that stupid to do something like this during this point. And, and, and B, but, but, but what about, we were all, we were all sat at home, we were, every, everyone, no one was doing anything like this. No one I know was doing anything like this. And so do they think they're on some higher plane to the rest of us? And of course this all came on the back of, <laughs> this, <laughs> this came on the back of like last year, was it last year, that we'd, we'd broken the story about Dominic Cummings going to Barnard Castle. Again, at the time we thought, 
I can't believe this. Nobody I know is going out the front door, let alone going to Barnard Castle. And then, but, and, we can understand, and then we can understand why would Boris Johnson stand by this man. But of course, it was obvious why he was standing by this man, because they were all at it all the time, breaking the rules. And it does matter, because these, those who make the rules have to live by the rules. And it's about our democracy <clears throat> is based on trust and decency and honesty. And if we can't trust, if we can't trust the Prime Minister, it gets... It's, it just all falls apart. It's like any relationship. If, if you can't trust the person you're talking to, it becomes dysfunctional. So, so now we've had this situation with Penn Farthing, the guy who brought all the, came back with all the dogs and cats, haven't we? And you look at that and you think, well, there's about six or seven emails now which would indicate that, that they were put at the front of the list and the, and the Prime Minister did put them. And he's still saying today, oh, this is, what was the word he used? Rhubarb. 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 I mean, I mean, just the use of the word, it's like it's in some sort of Just William sort of play rather than actually okay. running the country. So, Cartoon character, Rhubarb. It, <laughs> Rhubarb and custard. Yeah. And it's, but then I think, well, who do we believe? Who do we believe anymore about anything? And that's why right. I think it's just, it, it's got to end. It has to end. And, and really, I think, you know, J James, you, you're such a, you're an honourable, decent man. You fought in the British Army. How, how can you sort of feel connected with that? It's embarrassing for you. All right, I'll come back. The woman in the, in the glasses there. Yes. I haven't got much in common with Boris Johnson, but I do have a June birthday. And in June 2020, I celebrated my birthday sitting on the beach with four friends. Um, so I just kind of want to know what lessons this government have taught us about the importance of following regulations. Because I did that because I needed to. But I've since found out that the people making the rules didn't even, like, do that. All right. And the woman in the stripy T-shirt here. Before James said that um, Boris, you know, has got to... Um, he was furious with him in the decisions that he's made. If he feels like that, well, then why hasn't he called for the Prime Minister to resign? No, I'm going to come back to you both. Kavita. Yeah, I, I think it's very difficult. You know, as a leader, um, people put your trust in you. So, you know, where it is now, we, we've, we're seeing that trust has been lost. And it's many situations. We've had the Partygate scandal, we've had the Afghanistan emails that have come out and backtracking. Um, and, and that posed a problem because tomorrow, as our leader, if Boris Johnson needed to put into place more sanctions, would the British people listen? What, on, on Russia, you mean? No. Um, it, it, well, oh, sanctions on us in terms of COVID restrictions, right? Or any restrictions, or, you know, would, would the British people listen? You know, it could be bedlam. So this is a problem. And I think that Boris Johnson and, and the government really need to get a grip of this situation. And maybe the best thing is that Boris Johnson does resign. Because, you know, I, I have a workplace. I so know what were you the difference. Doing in your I, have yeah. a di I know the difference between a party and a meeting. And, you know, when you hear these things from very senior leaders, it's quite, you, you can't believe what you're hearing. OK. Um, I'm going to come back to you both. So, Jonathan, the point from, from the, the woman there that, that she might not be too happy with what the government's saying, but, but Labour's not cutting it for her either. Yeah, so I would say directly to you I've been a member of Parliament for 11 years, I've been in opposition for the entirety of that time. I've lost four general elections in a row whilst obviously winning my own seat. So I have the humility to know, yes, we, keep, we can't just rely on the government falling apart. We've got to do more and we are doing more to win your trust. But how do we do that? You demonstrate it, you don't just say it. So go back to the, the question about energy. We put forward a plan. Everyone here would take at least £200 off their energy bill, and for those people who were hit the most, it would be £600. And how would we do that? We'd do that through a windfall tax on the North Sea oil and gas producers. So we've got a clear view of how we would pay for that too. And that's, that's how you win that trust back. You offer solutions, you don't just criticise the government. And yes, we've got further to go, but that's what we're doing while this government are mired in their own scandal, and we'll continue to do it and hopefully eventually win the support of people like yourself. And, J and James, what's your response to what you're hearing here? Well, Firstly, if you win trust by delivering, and the government is delivering in spades, that there is uh, that the vaccine campaign and the way that this country is emerging from the pandemic is world leading. Uh, we are leading. We have, in, we have got the highest leading, death toll in Europe are, and one of are, the highest in the world. We are leading. Not per head. We are leading on head, one yeah. of the greatest geopolitical challenges of our time. There are more people in work and more vacancies for work than ever before. So, 
you know, actually, these things haven't happened by accident. These things have happened by good decisions made by But you, the hear, you hear what the, the audience here is saying, though, James. Well, the lady over there said, how can you be furious? <clears throat> and then so on. I mean, all I say is I'm furious with the whole thing. I mean, there are things that... Well, she's saying, how can you be furious that, and not want him well, to resign? because there are things that have happened that I don't think the Prime Minister is culpable for. But I think it is right that he has apologised for because they happened within number 10. But it is a cultural thing. And then just finally on... Um, on the Afghanistan Nauzad thing. Uh, so, I... Should we just explain? So this is, uh, for, for those who may not be aware, there was a chap called Penfather who ran an animal rescue shelter in Kabul, I think it was, in Afghanistan. At any rate, he was campaigning to get his, his animals out. There was quite a, a publicity campaign around that. In end, he did get his animals out. Emails have emerged which suggest... <laughs> Uh, emails leaked from the Foreign Office, I believe, which suggests that the Prime Minister authorised that. The Prime Minister has absolutely categorically denied that. So the Royal Air Force deploys and undertakes missions through one route only, and that is from the Prime Minister through the Secretary of State Defence to the Chief of the Defence Staff to the Royal Air Force. The Prime Minister did not at any point tell the Secretary of State for Defence or the CDS or anybody else in the MOD that he wanted any course of action whatsoever taken with regard to pen farthings animals. And but could he have told anyone now, else? The problem now is, though, because, because we don't trust him, because all the other stuff has gone on, we don't trust... That may well be true. That, what you say may well be true. But we, we don't trust the Prime Minister anymore because of all the other stuff that we know he's lied about. And Some that people still... You can't say we. You can't speak for the whole country well, with all respect. I know, know. but I think... A lot that, of the people well, want to give him the benefit of the doubt. A lot of people are sick of journalists trying but, to unseat him. But, well, I mean, I, I don't <laughs> take that out. You, you can't say we don't trust the Prime Minister okay. because some people still well, don't tell you what, Hang on, Alison. Alison, Alison, hang on one second, because there's a woman there who applauded that point, so let's hear from you. Are you one of those people who's sick of it? No, I'm not sick of him. I'm not. No, sick of it, sick of it. I'm generally. sick of it. I'm sick of the journalists. I'm sick of the media. You, you said yourself right at the beginning that you've never voted Conservative. Yeah. So straight away, you're going to go gunning, but, aren't but you? First, no, no, first and foremost... If that was a party... Yes then don't invite me because I won't be bothered putting lipstick on to go to it. <laughs> and yes, I can see the difference between a work meeting and a party. And that wasn't a party. Which one are so you referring to? The, the one where they're out on the terrace. Those people were working together, and you're exactly right with what you're saying. You're he's told where to go. He's, he's briefed and told that he'll just go and walk into situations. All this rubbish, absolute nonsense about parties, this, dogs, this, something else. Can you not see? We've got major things happening Absolutely. on a government. We could be on the step <laughs> of a third world war. Yes. And All you're right. talking about cheese and wine. All but, right, well, on that note... Well, we have got the police investigating it as well. Oh, yeah, as well. good. Right, right, well, On. Yeah. <laughs> you're definitely not going to convince <laughs> that one of I can tell you. On that note, let's take another question from <laughs> Helen. Helen Johnson, where are you? Ah, oh, there you go. Um, what are the implications for the UK if Russia invades Ukraine and should we get involved? So there you are. We are dealing with that issue. That is a question that a number of you asked. Liam, you were a former man in Moscow for The Economist. Yeah, I spent, I spent a lot of my adult life living, working in Moscow, journalist, academic, variety of consultancy roles and so on. I mean, if you... We're right to be concerned and we're right to be focusing on this. And thank you very much for your question. I think along with the cost of living crisis, uh, it is second to the cost of living crisis of what we should be thinking about, but it is second in what we should be thinking about. I, I look at the Russian press, I look at the Ukrainian press. While, of course, um, Russia is an extremely capable military power uh, and a pretty important economy, by the way, um, I don't see the population being prepared for some kind of attack on Ukraine, for some kind of invasion. Uh, if you talk to Russians who are under 30, they, they want Ukraine to be independent, and they're the, kind of, they're the people who would actually have to fight this war on the ground. So I don't think there's going to be an invasion any time soon. So if, what do you think if, Putin's if, if, doing, if, then? If, if I'm honest. And I don't think many people in Ukraine think so, either. I mean, the, the, the president of Ukraine... Volodymyr Zelensky. I mean, he's just told Joe Biden, who just took his diplomats out of Kiev very dramatically, they'd be safer in Kiev than they are in Los Angeles. So what is Putin after then, do you think? Cle clearly, in, in the Donbass, 500 miles east of Ukraine, there is a lot of tension. Uh, and I think people like James, our armed forces in general, for whom I have a great deal of respect, are right to be 
preparing and to be saying what they're saying. But if you go back to the mid-90s, when I was living and working in Russia full-time, one of the time periods I spent there, you had people like George Kennan. George Kennan was the diplomat historian, the architect of America's post-war foreign policy, the architect of Soviet containment. He said that expanding NATO was a, a fatal mistake. And I'm not saying that Poland shouldn't have joined NATO and the Eastern European countries shouldn't have joined NATO. But if you expand, try to expand NATO right up to the borders of a really big geostrategically important country of 11 time zones, then you are going to get a reaction. And what you will do is you will empower anti-internationalist forces in Russia, nationalist forces in Russia, people who are a lot more nasty than Vladimir Putin, by the way. And so if we are going to diffuse this situation, and we need to, Russia's the biggest energy exporter in the world, it's the biggest wheat exporter in the world. U Ukraine's the third biggest corn exporter in the world. This is really important for the cost of living crisis. If you are going to defuse the situation, as well as preparing and standing up to forces that you think are unjust, you also sometimes in politics and diplomacy and journalism have to demonstrate nuance, turn the telescope around, try and look at it from another country's perspective. And from the perspective of a lot of Russian people, I'll get slammed for saying this, but I know it's true, they think to expand Ukraine right up to the border of Russia to expand is NATO, very, yeah. very incendiary. I mean, think back to the Cuban Missile Crisis when Nikita okay. Khrushchev brought right. armaments to Cuba, which is 100, you know, 100 miles away from the US with a sea in the middle. That almost caused you know, a nuclear war. So we should be very, very okay. careful what we're doing here and not just be belligerent, but also try to understand okay. other countries' points of view. Let me bring the rest of the panel in. James, uh, a, a to what Liam is saying, but also the question is, what are the implications of the UK if Russia does attract UK and should we get involved? So I could talk for a week on it, so give me a kick. You when, definitely don't yeah, do exactly. that. Exactly. Um, so why, why should we get involved? Why does it matter? Well, I think that, first of all, just to be absolutely clear, nobody is talking about British troops being on the ground involved in any sort of conflict with Russia. Just so everybody's clear on that. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, and so our obligations that we have to NATO countries don't apply, and everybody's been very clear about that. And actually, it's very important that we're clear on that for the sake of Mr Putin, because I think he would love to be able to say to the Russian public that we're all spoiling for a fight. We're not. But it matters because Ukraine is a close ally. And it is a sovereign nation that has existed for a generation. And we cannot be comfortable with another country just deciding that it is going to annex another. The international response, I would argue, after Crimea was not good enough. So what it's should not, we do? not acceptable. What should, what should we've the UK response this, be? The, the well, I think what we have to do is be, first of all, very, very clear with the Russian public. Because Liam is 100% right. I don't think that the Russian public are willing to suffer tens of thousands of Russian casualties in the name of a Putin vanity project. But I think Mr Putin is being told, wrongly, that the Ukrainians are going to welcome him, him as a liberator. In reality, and I can tell you from having looked in the eyes of the Ukrainian armed forces, they are going to fight. So and what, what should we bloody. do? That's the question. What, well, what we have to do is give the Ukrainian armed forces every chance of succeeding. We have. The reason I was in Kiev ten days ago was to do the final detail around the delivery of the anti-tank missiles that we've provided. We need to lead within the international community to make sure that the financial sanctions that await uh, Mr Putin if he crosses that border are the most punitive that you could imagine. And we need to be absolutely clear with him and the Russian public that this will not be accepted, that what awaits them is a proud sovereign nation facing an existential threat that will fight every step of the way, and that at this 11th hour, turn back to diplomacy, don't cross the border. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what you failed to mention what uh, the UK produces is uh, Ukraine is oil and gas. And I think not, that's not what the issue is. Not to any great degree oil well, and gas. Well, they do. They do. I've okay. read it today, and they do produce right. a lot of oil and gas. <laughs> and I think that's why this issue's coming to a head. It's about oil and gas transportation across okay. Ukraine. You're right in that sense. You're if, talking if, about the North Street if, pipeline. If, if, let me, let, no, the North Street pipeline is the north it goes, of goes, Yes, no. it avoids Ukraine. Yes, the man here in the blue jumper. You talk about sanctions. 
uh, against Russia. But can't Russia employ sanctions against us? I mean, by cutting off the gas supply? Yes, well, of course... Or cutting is... off anything else that they supply? Well, of course, that is one of the big uh, concerns. Jonathan? Uh, Helen, there would be significant implications for the UK if the worst happens, but we should be unequivocal in our support for the, for the people of Ukraine. Uh, clearly, the security situation in Europe would be transformed. We'd be less safe. Uh, we'd go back, though, to the days when big countries feel they can be in charge of the affairs of those around them and for the rest of the world, for the Pacific, for China, for Taiwan, it would be a, a domino effect that none of us, I think, should wish to contemplate. In terms of what it, what it means, and I, and I, I, Lima, I really respect your, your view and your experience of, of Russia, but I would say if you look at what, who controls Russia, if you look at the security elite and how they have looted that country's wealth at the expense of ordinary people, you can't blame the younger people in Ukraine for looking towards the West and wanting something for themselves, which is, frankly, much better than that. And I, I think we should share that aspiration, and we shouldn't see this being as something, some return to Cold War politics, where Putin thinks he can just go in uh, and take over. So it will be difficult, Helen, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that. I don't that. think they should but have to choose. They should be able to okay. live and work where they want. But, but that is not what they They don't have to choose up. between right. West and East. Yeah. Well, but, but no one's having Ukraine... No one's suggesting Ukraine joins NATO. There are 100,000 Russian troops right now around Ukraine. So, really, is it yeah, the it's Russians not a choice who are willing to let us do that? The young people of Ukraine, either Europe or Asia and Russia, I mean... Why can't, we're they, not surrounding why can't they do business everywhere? That's what will ensure peace. All right. Business. Let's, let's hear a bit more. Of, yes. What I was going to say is, how far do you let someone go um, before you intervene? You so know? how far do we intervene? Yeah, is yeah. Putin so, allowed to go before so we intervene? How far is Putin allowed to go? Is he allowed to... We're saying we're not going to let him go into... Kiev, um, into the Ukraine. The Ukraine. But... If he steps over the line, we're going to impose sanctions. And, and then, if it, how far is it going to go? How uh, far do you let someone carry on? OK. Alison. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. I mean, Putin's clearly had his sights on recreating a sort of Soviet-style empire for many, many years. And he's also done a pretty good job of, like, destabilising other countries across Western Europe as well. And, you know, we, we poison people on British soil. So <clears throat> he's a nasty little bully, is exactly what he is. Um, and we have got to do everything we can to support the people from Ukraine, who there'll be people there tonight who might be thinking that in the next few weeks, their sons and daughters might, on themselves might be dying at the hands of, of the troops that are now gathering on that border. Um, so yes, you know, as James said, we can be there. We can, we can be brutal about, sa about sanctions. We, can be, um, we should be looking at all that sort of dirty Russian money that's been swilling around London for years. And we should be doing everything we can to support the Ukrainians. Um, but we've also got to try and find a way, to, if, if at all possible, to, if, to, to diffuse it before it gets to that point. But the key thing, if we're going to show real strength against Putin, who he's, you know, wants to act the hard guy, is to have real unity across Europe. Absolutely. And there, I think, you know, it's not been great this week, you know, some of the things we've seen from France and Germany, but really the only way you stand up to somebody like that is to show that you're strong and you're united. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely agree. You know, you've got a bully there and the West has to show that they are united because it could have serious implications. You've got economic um, implications, uh, you know, 40% of the gas going from Russia and does go through Ukraine. Um, and then you've got the human um, cost, you know, uh, innocent Ukrainian lives. So we have to support uh, Ukraine um, and we have to um, mobilize the Ukrainian troops um, through training and however we can to support them because it's a big implication. Um, but he, he's got to understand that, you know, the West are united and will pose sanctions because he is an absolute bully and that we are serious and that's the only way to stand up to something like this. So, you know, we have to support the Ukrainians. OK, let's take a final question from Fiona Walkington. Um, in 2015, David Cameron and George Osborne visited Morecambe and extolled the Northern powerhouse. The current Prime Minister talks about levelling up. When will the North-South divide finally be addressed? And you're asking this question, Fiona, how does it feel to you? <laughs> how does it feel for you, Fiona, in terms of the North-South divide? 
that we're not really making any progress, not just in terms of the high-speed rail, but in terms of local transport as well, local opportunities for young people and investment in the <coughs> north. All right. Alison. Um, as to when it will happen, I fear it may still be quite some time yet. So the, the last election was fought heavily on this, this slogan about levelling up. Um, two years on, yes, we've had a pandemic, it's been horrendous, but we've seen very little, <clears throat> very little action in this area. I mean, we've seen, as, as you said, about the um, high-speed rail links, but, but beyond that, there's, it's the local things. It's about the, the reduction in bus routes. It's about the closing of high street shops. It's about, you know, taking away the uplift in universal credit, which means people haven't got so much money to spend. It's about all the things we've been saying about the cost of living, the national insurance hike. That means people haven't got money in their <coughs> pockets to spend on their high streets. It's endless, the number of things, and it's this drip, drip, drip. I mean, even this week, there was a story that came out about for every one job that's created in the north, three jobs are created in London and the South East. So it kind of feels almost that we're going in reverse. And I think this government now has to sort of on so many things that think slogans are not enough. People want to see action because they deserve action. This is a fantastic town. You've got great people, great opportunities, but there's got to be the support, the infrastructure, the working with private yeah. investment to get businesses to move here, to actually use all those talents that are here so that it can thrive. And that's what people need to okay. see. We'll need to be reasonably brief. We haven't got a lot of time. There's the man at the back. So you've got... Um... You've got the Eden Project North that's planning permissions, about to get put in for that. It's going to need government funding. About 70 million, I think, is the figure. A lot of money in other places. Should it be coming to Morecambe, it's going to have a great boost for the area economically. Okay. For a long, long time to come, <laughs> it will really uplift the area. Is the government going to fund it? I'm sure you've done your swatting up on the local area, James. I was tipped off about Eden North. I'm afraid I haven't <coughs> come with good news. That doesn't mean there's bad news. It just means that I don't think the decision's been made. Um, do you want me to answer the rest of the question? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I, I was really worried when I was on the train up that you would ask the levelling up question as a north-south thing, because I'm a south-west MP, and actually it's not a north-south thing, it's a south-east and London thing versus the rest of the regions of the UK. And I was worried that I might not get out of here alive having to say that, but similarly, I wouldn't get re-elected <coughs> if I wasn't clear on that. Um, we in the south-west share your pain about sort of you know, investment and prosperity and feeling like um, we haven't been invested in for, for a number of generations. Um, well, you're the, in government. What are you the world that we are, and, and the levelling up white paper is just weeks, days or weeks away, uh, which is the, 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 the centrepiece of it all. Um, but I think, look, there is stuff going on. I know that Morecambe isn't in the town's fund, but I think that Preston is, and there are some other Lancashire towns, and I've got some down in Somerset that have got it too. That is Richmond a catalytic, is that is a, that is a catalytic, catalytic intervention. I know there's debate over exactly what uh, the £96 billion on rail is doing, and some people think it's doing the right thing, some people are doing the wrong thing, okay. but it is the single right. biggest investment in our railways the, ever. I'm going to have to move around so, the panel, James, forgive me. You've been let down for <laughs> decades. This government is starting to turn that around. But, 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 uh, but give but us a hey, chance. Hey, hey, let's, let's hear from the rest of the panel. Kavita, you wanted so, to come in. Um, in terms of levelling up, absolutely, you know, it was one of the, the 2019 manifesto. And, you know, so much is needed in the northern cities. I'm actually from Derbyshire in Derby, and I'm pleased to say we were one of the 105, one of the 105 areas that got a bid in, in November for 70 million. One of our projects in Derby South got 50 million and that's going to uh, support uh, 5,000 houses, a green village, roads to one of our biggest employers, which is Rolls-Royce, and create growth. However, there's so much more to do. You know, a lot of the levelling up task force, a lot of the civil servants, the two thirds are still London centric. And we need that to be spreading okay. so that local decision making can happen in places like Morecambe. All right. So, um, Jonathan? I, mean, I grew up in Sunderland and I live now my adult life in Thameside in Greater Manchester and I understand James the point about it isn't just a north-south divide, I get that, but I think there is a, a serious and genuine point about parts of how this country have worked for some time, that, that disadvantaged parts, particularly of the northwest. and I would say actually you know, nearly every government since the war has tried to do something on this. 
And the irony is, despite this being your flagship policy, you're, you're one of the worst by terms of delivery. I mean, we don't know what levelling up really means yet, do we? That's why the white paper's coming out. And let's be honest, we're only a year away from a, probably a general election anyway. The answer, I think, genuinely, is not about moving civil servants around, although I think there's a role for that. It's about jobs. It's about good private sector jobs that you can raise a family on. And that is the problem. The system doesn't give that a big increase in investment, particularly around the transport system and particularly around how we reach uh, net zero would be how I would do oh, that. Right. Okay, okay, hang on. Let's get his impatience, but... but well, we're going to run out of time. Just, I we just need a £5 billion pound investment in just outside Preston by bringing the National Cyber Force here. Mm. Exactly the sort of catalytic intervention that brings a whole industry okay. around cyber security Liam, to the North West. It's exactly the right question. I'm glad to end on a note of agreement with my fellow journalist, Alison, on this. When you look at the numbers... I'm a bit of a nerd. I look at lots of numbers of regional imbalance in income per head. It, we are the most regionally imbalanced major economy yeah. in the world, and lockdown made us meet even more imbalanced because people in towns, particularly in the north of England, suffered so much more during lockdown in terms of their income. I still think HS2 is a white elephant. I would like to see a lot more investment in Transpennine. <laughs> Rail route, linking together our fabulous northern cities into a, a, an economy which could rival London. These are cities with incredible global brands that can attract huge amounts of investment, huge talent. And we should really be putting money into not massive vanity projects, high-speed trains that are obsolete when they're already built, when it will finally emerge, probably in the mid-2030s or something. We should be putting money into local commuter routes, into buses, into into schemes that allow people in towns like this to get to slightly bigger conurbations. That's where the jobs are for you and your kids. And yet all I see is ministers pandering to the big engineering lobby, building a high-speed train that no-one wants. Right. We've got about 30 seconds or so. Let's hear from the woman in the, in the, at the back, in the, in the brown dress, yes. Yeah, given the reports of... Um Leveling up funds being misused to repair potholes on driveways. How can we have any faith in the leveling up agenda? All righty. And let's hear from the woman here in the brown top. I, I, I feel that part of the leveling up agenda is based on the contempt that the South East has for any other area of the country. You come out with a slogan and then it's pat you on the head, sit there quietly. We, we've said what we're going to say, but we're not going to give you any funds for it. We just feel like we're treated with utter contempt by Westminster all the time. All righty. I think on that note, we will have to end. We are out of time. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you to the panel thank for coming you. along this evening. Thank you. thank you to our audience here in Morecambe. Great to see you. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Morecambe. Bye-bye.